Looks like I'm shooting a mukbang. Is that grease? This is a bun. You're looking at one of the most deceptive pieces of food in all of the industry. This light, flaky, tasty device sits at the bottom and the top of our cheeseburger or our favorite chicken sandwich designed to secure the actual stars of the show. But no, the bun is no backup singer. No, it very much so deserves its time in the spotlight. What if I told you that the bun represents everything wrong with fast food? Fast food has the entire nation wrapped around its greasy little fingers. If you can drive five miles in any direction and not find a fast food joint, congrats, you live in the sticks. But for the rest of us, it's everywhere. And it's just so dang convenient. Hi, what can I get you? you guys serving lunch yet? No. Take care. I mean, we know this stuff isn't good for us, or at least that's what we're told. What are we really getting ourselves into when we order fast food? How you doing? Take care. Big back, big back, big back, big back. Yeah, my back is loaded up with yeah, snacks and different Robert. foods. Squeeze into this tiny shirt. My big back has no room. Big back, big back, hey. big Don't back, me. big back. Mike just eat a Big Mac. Mike just ordered DoorDash. Big back, big back, big back, big back. Yeah. Okay, so there are three things I point out about what's wrong with fast food. One and two, if you give us some thought, you can probably guess. But number three, I bet we'll probably throw you for a loop. Funny enough, all three are exemplified by this little sucker right here, the bun. Welcome to No Love Code Require. My name is Johnny Cole Dixon, and the bun may seem like the most simple and harmless part of fast food, but just a quick glance at its ingredients list relative to everything else that comes on a typical sandwich, and the clues start to reveal themselves. So what's the first thing wrong with fast food? Number one, irresponsible amounts of sugar. Now, sugar may not be the first thing you think of when you see fast food. You may think sugar and you think something like, I don't know, fruit snacks or two bite brownies, but the typical fast food sandwich is actually riddled with sugar. I have some special guests with me. The gospel that is the Chick-fil-A sandwich. I have the Whopper from Burger King. Wop, 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 wop. Kendrick Lamar, and I have the Big Mac, the king himself. Check out these ingredients lists. McDonald's was easy to find. You just Google it and go to the website. But you can't find Chick-fil-A bun ingredients online. I had to go in store. Once in store, I had to ask the cashier what the ingredients of the bun were, and he just gave me a blank stare for five seconds, and he went like this. I was like, okay, and he took me to the back where there was this massive printer and he printed out a small little receipt and read on it was all of the ingredients that goes into a Chick-fil-A bun. That may be a little dramatized, but he really did print me out a receipt with all of the ingredients on it. Here's me trying to get a little B-roll of it, but my shutter was covering my camera. Nice work, Johnny. Oh, oh yeah, there you go. Show it while you're driving. Awesome, John. You can't really find Burger King ingredients anywhere online or in store. I went to two different stores and I got turned away. But that's really okay because here's the thing, a lot of these burger bun ingredients are mostly the same. It doesn't really matter where you go to get your fast food fix. What we're going over in this video applies to them all, especially Subway. You're ordering a what long? The average fast food buns are coming in around 30 grams of sugar. They tend to be about 80 to 90% of the total sugar content of the average fast food sandwich. To put this in perspective, two two bite brownies lands us around 25 grams of sugar. Notably less sugar compared to just the bun. I don't believe we eat fast food because it's quick. I mean, we could convince ourselves all day that we don't have the time to prepare our food, but that's not the problem as far as our perspective is. What we're really saying is that food isn't really that important to me and I have no problem relinquishing this part of my life up to the will of the industry. Fast food is inherently insulting. It insults our ability to prepare our own food. So do we gotta go back to the olden days when the man went out to work and the woman stayed back and cooked for eight hours? I read online, why don't fast food joints at least give us the option of whole wheat bread? And that's a really 
good question, but the answer is because it wouldn't make a difference. Yes, no, what, no kidding. This is a wheat kernel. It's what we harvest to turn into flour to make our bread. There are three main parts of the kernel. The bran, which effectively acts as the fiber of the grain. The germ is the embryo of the grain, the part that grows into a new plant. It holds and provides a lot of vitamins and minerals. And then we have the endosperm, which is the fun part. It's starch. It provides the energy. In this case, we can loosely translate energy to sugar. Sugar is fuel to make energy. In fact, if it wasn't for the endosperm, this plentiful starch, we wouldn't be nearly as interested in the wheat grain, as this is the only thing that's left over when we refine the grain down into flour. That's right, we take out the bran and the germ when we make flour. That's oftentimes when you look at the ingredients list of our breads, they have vitamins and minerals enriched back into them because simple white flour is virtually void of all nutrition. Well, contrast that with whole grain wheat flour. We leave the germ and the bran in. That's awesome, we're saying that we're leaving in the fiber. But as you can probably guess, it may not really be as it seems. This is the glycemic index. It's an unstandardized scale that researchers compose to evaluate how different foods impact our blood sugar compared to glucose. Glucose is the terminal end carbohydrate. So what are we saying? When we eat bread, pasta, cake, potatoes, chips, primarily carbohydrate foods, when digesting them, the body ultimately wants to break them down into glucose. Glucose is the most simple little sugar that just like gas for a car, provides fuel for the body to run. America runs on Dunkin', the body runs on glucose. You get it. Because glucose is the end-all be-all sugar of the body, we can use it as a reference for other carbohydrates. We can make a scale. 0 to 100 for how high our blood sugar rises with different foods. With glucose being at 100 as pure glucose would have the most profound impact on our blood. White bread will consistently find itself near the top, about 75 points on the glycemic index, regularly finding itself classified as a high GI food. Food. To put this in perspective, table sugar finds itself around 65, honey a tad less, and chocolate even less when compared to glucose. White bread, aka bun bread, ain't no joke. And it makes sense when you think about it. I mean, we refine the heck out of the flour and we just beat the brakes off it, remove it of its fiber. But whole grain wheat bread that we leave the fiber in would have a totally different impact. Yep. Oh yeah, no, okay. Yeah, I can let them know, I'll relay it. Hey, hey, say hi to Leslie and the kids for me. All right, yeah, no, you got it. All right, take care. Uh, apparently, whole grain wheat bread ain't making no difference. In fact, that whole grain wheat bread is coming in one point less than white bread on the glycemic index. It's funny because we're talking about the bun because it represents everything wrong with fast food. But remember, we ordered fries on the side, right? Fries, potato, that's carb, that's starch, that's sugar. And then we washed it down with a medium Coke. Our blood is about to go into an absolute sugar frenzy. There aren't really safe places to look in fast food, especially because of the second thing we're about to go over. Before we go there, let me tell you about my weekend. It was a refreshing Saturday afternoon. Me and some friends got together to play pickleball and it was fun. I think we went about 3-1, me and my doubles partner and nobody got injured, right? I consider that a good day. I later learned we probably weren't keeping score correctly. Who made pickleball so complicated? After the games, we sat on the sidelines and recovered and I ran to my car and I brought back some element packets to help was replenish after being active. Now for those that have never heard of Element, they're changing the hydration game. So long are the days we replenish with conventional sugary drinks with added coloring and they probably aren't offering enough of the stuff they were drinking it for in the first place. Electrolytes. These little things are the key to proper hydration. Sodium, potassium, and magnesium are the actual boots to ground workers to how our body moves. They are what's used to have our nervous system communicate. They are more than just essential. They empower our entire system. The more that we move, the more that we lose. And that's why Element is going out to make sure that we are getting all of that good stuff back. You can keep it gangsta and get their raw salt or liven things up with some flavor. You can play around with the ratios. I heard people are mixing them. There are some recipes online. They're so fun. Yet I probably wouldn't be talking about them if I didn't actually feel the outcome. I went from being a big old crampy mess that couldn't even complete his training to being completely cramp free in a season where I 
was moving the most I ever have in my life. You're an active individual, you are taking up fasting, you spend time in the sun, or maybe you just like bringing into the body what you know it's gonna need to operate at its best from head to toe. Go below in my description and grab yourself up some salt. And with any purchase, you can actually get a free sample pack to go along with it. This includes a purchase of the new Element Sparkling that they released, which is unbelievably awesome. And I was impressed by the reviews. Feel the difference of what it's like to empower yourself without the junk. Thank you, Element, for hydrating this little low community. Appreciate you. Let's get back to the video. Fast food is problematic, and we're targeting bread because it kind of hilariously possesses everything wrong with fast food. But it is far from the only culprit, especially when we consider number two. What's wrong with fast food? Irresponsible amounts of seed oil. I just cannot not talk about seed oils. It's hard to talk about any food that we eat outside of the premises of our home and the subject of these bastardized seed oils do not come up. They promote heart disease, inflammation, and oxidation. What's this? Soybean oil lowers circulating cholesterol levels and coronary heart disease risk and has no effect on markers of inflammation and oxidation. For those of us that are not hip to what seed oils are, here's a quick rundown. They are sometimes called vegetable oils, but we like to call them seed oils because they are extracted from the literal seeds of plants. We take them, extract them, refine them, degum them, neutralize them, bleach them, de-wax them, deodorize them. We end up with this uniform shelf-stable oil and we put it in everything. Just about everything in the center of our grocery stores, restaurants that we sit down in, and you guessed it, fast food joints have these oils. And soybean oil is the number one consume seed oil not only here in the US but all over the world. Now I've actually had this paper saved since about the time it came out and consistently used this particular article as a reference for soybean oil's popularity and ubiquity to prove that it's nearly impossible in, to, in modern day to avoid these seed oils. Now, the article makes four claims. Building one heck of a defense against soybean oil's involvement in disease. Lowers cholesterol, lowers heart disease risk, no effect on inflammation, no effect on oxidation. Now, this is quite the positive report card for soybean oil. We would have to think that somebody is grading seed oils on a serious curve. Oh, but you take a closer look, the lead researcher of this article is the director of research for the Soy Nutrition Institute. This is a severe conflict of interest and it's likely contributing to some bias. But, but, but that does not mean the entire paper is garbage. I read every word some years back and I extracted some merit. I could probably do the same now. A conflict of interest does not mean that good science is not being done. However, those are four significant claims and I almost got in trouble again. I always do this when I just want to go into a deep dive. I almost said, let's address all four claims, but that would just suck the air out of this video. How However, I did go deeper into one of the four claims in oxidation because I would make the argument that you don't have to contribute to all four of these aspects to be a very serious problem and seed oils do have a specific impact that is worth talking about. You can watch my video on that. I'll have it in the description. You can watch it after this one. Maybe we could do a deep dive on all four in a live stream or something someday. But let's just think about this for a sec. It was the 1940s. Soybean oil was considered neither a good industrial oil nor a good edible oil. When used in paint solutions, it dried slow and left residue. And when used as an edible oil, it tasted like paint. We had not quite figured it out yet, but it wasn't for a lack of of trying. You see, soybean oil was problematic and seed oils really were problematic from the jump. It actually took us 12 years to learn how to even extract the oil from the seed because it wasn't as simple as just crushing it as we would the olive or the coconut. I'm so awkwardly far away from Chick-fil-A. <laughs> but check this out. Here's an ad from 1904. The gas stove was a hot new thing. Before this, we were putting up with coal stoves and open hearths. To cook on one of these, it took skill, precision, and probably some good reflexes. We've always been striving to make preparing food more convenient, and we've gotten really good at it, but there's a threshold in which convenience starts to harm. So now we're at a point where in order to be healthy, we have to revert back and uh, overcorrect, maybe not all the way to the early 1900s, but to a point to where we can reintroduce some of these things that gives us more autonomy. My generation has it real bad. Don't want to cook. Don't want to learn how to cook. But honestly, I think that's just because we don't really know what food is or that principle of convenience and how that really works. If so, I don't know if we'd be that interested in the dashing of the doors. 
Eventually, we started using chemicals to extract the oil, and it worked. But we didn't necessarily use that oil for edible purposes. It wasn't until 1945 soybean oil had become a widely consumed edible oil. Wait, but hold up. Just because we were consuming it, doesn't mean it was good. In 1945, the flavor of soybean oil was singled out as the number one problem of the soybean industry. You see, it took 12 years to come up with a decent soybean oil because its crude oil was gross by definition, smelled and looked bad. And this is in regards to its industrial use. So how much more should we have to refine it for us to eat it? I guess you could ask, why were we forcing this in the first place? It would seem as if soybean oil would rather had just been left alone. Ah, we were in an urgent matter. War. World War II introduced some serious rationing of fats and oils in the 1940s. We needed to figure out how to make soybean oil edible. And we did it. It was forced into margin formulations and discounted because of its awful taste. So edible, but inferior. The industry knew that this would lead to an inevitable downfall when the rationing was over. So what can we do to make the oil good now, like yesterday? 1946, the industry banded together the Soybean Research Council, the first of what will become a yearly meeting in my backyard, Chicago sick of all these disastrous meetings in my backyard. The government, academics, and organizations alike showed up. Notable attendees, Procter & Gamble, Swift & Company, and General Mills. The goal, make better soybean oil products. Took some trial and error because soybean oil still had a reputation of going rancid and developing a fishy smell and taste. We then figured out it was the molecular structure of the oil that led to the off smell. We then started hydrogenating the oil, which is a process to make it more stable. Bada boom, bada bing a bunch of chemistry and processing later, we have your favorite soybean oil. Now I'm sure we can explain away and at least seemingly vindicate soybean oil, but why go through the trouble? We're automatically better off eating what we've been eating for millennia instead of attempting to justify the franken food that is seed oils that's also synonymous with processed foods. Seed oils are not health foods, but not because we don't grow organic plants. It's because of the amount of steps of processing it takes to make it a viable, edible product forfeited from any attempt to make it organic organic while simultaneously disqualifying it from whole food status, which is still the North Star for optimal health. I'm not gonna sit here and act like I haven't had my share of fast food, but I will sit here and tell you what's wrong with fast food and answer the question number three, irresponsible amounts of convenience. The little ones coming up under us are gonna have it even worse. As sometimes the mountain that is convenience seems insurmountable. That's why only you, can't prevent wildfires. I hope you guys gained some insight and perspective out of this one. I'm gonna get about y'all with.